First thing first, Store of the Realms. As you can see, this here is the box of the first edition of, of, the, of the Realms. And uh, actually, it was born before that. The, the Forgotten Realms was born way before that because it was born out of the mind of an eight-year-old at Greenwood. He was a child and he imagined that there was this mage coming from a past Earth, like, not a past Earth, but parallel worlds, which in the past connected to the Earth. And because they connected and they had dragons and fairies and that stuff, those legends ended up being our legends. And now, at some point, the connection between those worlds was lost. And those realms, they were forgotten. They became the Forgotten Realms. The realms where our legends from Earth came from. And, well, he started developing these ideas more and more as a child, mostly getting you know, to sort of a place to create his own stories, to, to write what he, he thought about, you know, like uh, fantasy stories. But when Dungeons and Dragons appeared and he was like a young guy and that was awesome and he started doing it, he wrote a few, a few uh, articles to the Dragon magazine and they liked it. And uh, that sort of gave him the impulse, you know. And later on, there were some very successful and very strange adventures. They, they could have a, a video just for them, the Bloodstone group of adventures. And after that, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons were sort of born. And this is one of the very first campaign settings for the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, although it has this advanced here, it's actually sort of a very, not well organized, but compiled version of the original Dungeons and Dragons at its core, how it was thought of, okay? Cool. With that in mind, let's continue here. So, then the, the realms were born. And when the realms were born, they were sort of a bit of your standard run of the meal fantasy setting, okay? So you had the... Oh, this is this is a surprise book. Wait, <laughs> uh, you had your uh, uh, you had it had a lot of token influence, so it had to get have because Dungeons and Dragons itself compiled a lot of the token lore. So you had this here is the Sword Coast original map. Actually, not the hand drawn map by by Ed himself, but it's the the map of the Sword Coast. And the Sword Coast is where the most adventures take place in the Forgotten Realms. And nowadays in the 5th edition, this is also the, the main place for most of the campaigns that they publish. And as you can see, it was sort of the same thing, like the, the, the rough stuff is here. And uh, it did have some special stuff, but it was not, like I said, very much different from other fantasy settings. You have your elves, you have your trolls, you have the evil dragons and orcs and so on. Uh, and now what makes it different is because uh, just as Eddie Greenwood started with the advanced Dungeons and Dragons, he had to deal with this changing from aha, uh -huh, D&D, old D&D and the original one, bah, chaotic. Oh, now we have the advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, so these rules compiled, all right? I do that in my mind, cool. But that idea that he had to do that to create this campaign setting was sort of a formulation of the lands, people, and how to, to make a campaign there, that led to something that sort of characterizes the Forgotten Realms as a campaign setting through the Dangerous and Dragons editions. And that is the fact that Forgotten Realms was probably, I believe it is, the it was the first setting that had sort of a an in-universe explanation why the changes from edition to edition happen. That's pretty cool. Like, example, let's give the first example. In the original Dangerous and Dragons, uh, actually, the, the, in Eddie and D, you had this here. Let me just take it. In Eddie and D, you had the Assassin class. So, this is the player's handbook of the of that uh, of our day there. And here you had the Assassin class. The Assassin class was sort of a thief subclass. There it is. This is a pretty cool image to show. <laughs> this, is the, this is the thief from the first edition Dungeons and Dragons. So, no, you don't have your fantasy anime-like 
you know, flying orphan. You have this crude guy there, all right? This is the thief from the original editions. Uh, and a, a good notice, notice that in the very, very first Dungeons and Dragons, there was no thief. There were only mages, clerics and warriors. But I won't go into detail about that this time, as I did on the Portuguese video, sorry. Today focusing on AD&D. Anyway, you had the assassin class near the thieves. And the assassin class had this here that I'm gonna show now. The assassin class had the assassination table. And this here is the, <laughs> is the money that you can demand for, for the victims that you are gonna kill. Detail, even a level one assassin had some real chance here to beat some high level people. And there was the money that you could have to pay then and so on. And why is that? That's because in the, in the original rules, the assassin was like really a killer, okay? It was not, let me put the Moonshine Islands down in the focus. The assassin in the original edition it had a 50% chance of immediately killing, doesn't matter how many, many hit points, an enemy that could surprise and do an assassination attempt, according to the, the rules there. Sometimes it was complex. Anyway, you had this chance. And as long as the animal is somewhat similar to your level, the chance was 50%. So this is very high. It's saying that, for example, a fourth level assassin could well go into an ogre and tuck backstab, kill. No, no matter, you know, damage, rolling for damage. No, not necessary. Uh, and if you didn't kill him with the assassination, you would still do the backstab damage, which was with what we now call the sneak attack. But at the time, it was a multiplier to the damage. You just rolled the dice and multiplied it. And it got, got higher the more levels you had. Uh, and if that also didn't kill... No, actually, that was the third part. Because the second one was checking for poison. And at that time, poison was usually save or die. Okay. <laughs> Not for us, you, player assassins had a slightly less powerful poison usually before they got to level five or so on. But anyway, let's not lose too much time on the assassins. The assassin was a class and when the, the, the change happened and you got this map here, this beautiful thing changed and suddenly you got this here, the, oh, the second edition of Forgotten Realms. Let me get it, just a sec. When this guy here appears, th there was one in between, but it was the con content-wise, it was the same as this one. This is the second box for the Forgotten Realms. And when this, before this came up, they made another book, which is this one, which was the first book that like, it was, for, for me, it was like, wow, wow, what, what kind of idea is that? This is awesome. I love this. It, which was this one here, let me get it, this guy, this guy here, notice they updated the horse with a guy, is now with the horse with a gall, and this powerful lady here represents the Forgotten Realm Adventures, which was the transition book. This book had sort of the whole material except for the maps of the box, and not the whole, but a lot of it, but it was made as a transition material and it gave the in-game reasons which were coupled with a novel that came at the time, a, a, a trilogy, uh, actually, the, nowadays it's a fifth, five books, but at the time it was three, which explained in-game madness, the so-called time of troubles when the gods walked the earth and everything went awry and it went really awry and it's as, actually, in my opinion, it's the most awesome time to, to play in the realms. <laughs> which is what we're gonna do, by the way, on the next campaign is during this period. And this game saw that, okay, if you have characters from the first edition, now we are transitioning to second edition, and these events are happening in your campaign, and many people hate when meta plots happen in their campaigns, I can understand that, but if you go with the flow and you do it, it can be a very cool thing, because here they look at it from the point of view of, okay, there are the rules for that. So, example, in the story, for reasons that I'm gonna not go spoil here, assassins ceased to be as a class, sort of became such a prof only a profession. And that cease to be has a very strong effect on players that play assassins, right? So what do you do now? And they have interesting, sometimes wonky, but mostly cool rules 
how to handle those characters. So, for example, if you had a character of fifth level that now has to be sort of a... Yeah, sometimes they die, sometimes they just uh, have to, to say, look, I'm not adventuring any longer, whatever. You can create the reason uh, or you change the class. They got, for example, one point of uh, one attribute point per character level for the new character that you rolled. Important. At that time, all right, back then, it was not usual for people to have level 15, 20th level characters. It was common for people to have like, if you have a character level six, seven, you were like, yay, okay? So at some point you got to, to nine and then it was like, whoa, and now I should uh, uh, put this character on, on hold and go to another new one. So because the level nine, the so-called name level, was so rare and it was sort of like, okay, now that I got there, I'm gonna get a castle or a guild. And you get a castle and you get a guild if you're a thief. And I'm a manager of this, right? And now I'm Baron. And some there were the rules to play this, but it was sort of expected that you retire your character and go for the, the new stuff. Anyway, here, if you retire the character, you have these cool rules that change them somewhat. And for example, the, ex the, the ranger in the original editions used wizard and druid spells. And a, a few of, and, and for example, there were no specialist mages as we know in the second edition. And all these changes were made with an in-game explanation for them that comes in this book. Explaining like, okay, due to this, what happened to this and this god, the god of magic and the god of da da da. Now, things changed. And this means that now I move to one of the Forgotten Realms specific aspects of, of this video again, or, or this live session. And by the way, if you have questions, just write them there, down there in the chat. Uh, I'm all, all for it. Continuing. In Forgotten Realms, the gods are slightly... The, the way they work, the function, is not... Especially before the Time of Troubles, is not exactly the same as gods in other uh, campaign settings. In the realms, the, the deities, they have so-called portfolios. That's similar, right? But to have more, much more uh, nitty-gritty detail. Example, you have the goddess of cold, or the, the, the semi-demigoddess of uh, south wind, in the case of the pantheon of the, the east. And the idea was that the gods were what kept the world as it is. Like Eo, that's sort of the over-deity, created everything. It's never really explained, depending on the edition. I believe the later editions tried to make a world creation epos. But originally there was no big explanation. It was like, there's an Eo, this is the overgod, and this, per, this de deity created the other deities. And out of the primal chaos of the universe, now there is a world, or many worlds, in fact, two worlds. And <coughs> in this world, the gods are sort of responsible to keep that which chaos enables a reality. So, for example, if I am the god of fire, I'm the one responsible that fire burns, that it burns correctly, and that everything gets burned at some point, that can be burned, and some things can't be burned because perhaps I decided that, or the other god had a fight with me, and now the element that they protect, I can't influence, and so on. A, a very practical and very cool example. Uh, uh, later on, after the Time of Troubles, there is a sort of a new god of death. And no, before that, there is the original god of strife and tyranny and so on, which is sort of the big bad evil guy in, in the Forgotten Realms in the first, and it's sort of the start of the second edition. This guy is not, his avatar is not specialized in any weapon, which was a power that fighters and even rangers in the original edition could have. And why not? Because he had <laughs> sort of a, 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 a grudge with the god of war. And because of that, the god of war, as his post is fighting in itself, no, you can fight. You are a god, gods can fight. But you can't fight that good. You can't be specialized in anything. Because you pissed me off. <laughs> That's forgotten him for you. If a god is the, has its portfolio of power, it's really over and above even the other gods. And uh, 
one of the gods that I particularly like in the Forgotten Realms is called Helm. Helm is the hand of the eye, the ever open eye, and he's the god of guardians. And uh, yeah, he had a very, very tough role during the time of troubles because he was sort of the one that had to contain the other gods from doing whatever they pleased. Because Eyo ordered him to keep these people down there until they learn how to be really gods and be responsible for their portfolios and for the people that live in this world that we created. And uh, yeah, so as you can see, this makes for a very interesting campaign time. And uh, before I go back to that, because this will be the, the campaign epos, epoch where we, we, we will play the, the next campaigns that you're going to see in this channel, uh, there is one interesting thing here. The Forgotten Realms loved this idea, right? Yay, we are the campaign setting that has the meta plot tied to the game rules. So if the game rules change, we change too in the universe. And of course, this was not followed by the latter, because later on you have the, the, the very successful uh, Dries the Urden series, series from A.R. Salvatore about the Dark Elf that is ponymous with Dangerous and Dragons, right? Very, very famous, probably the most famous D&D character. And uh, his story sort of followed their thing. But the other stories from the Forgotten Realms, they tied more to that. But even Dries is affected by this. Like, A.R. Salvatore was also, look, there's gonna be this event now, the Sundering, for example. There's gonna be this event now, because we're moving to 3rd edition. Now we're moving to 4th edition. And by the end of the 4th edition, it, as we all know, it was sort of a uh, <laughs> hiccup in the Dungeons and Dragons story. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Greenwood and the others look, oh, this is too much. Everybody wants Dungeons and Dragons back sort of to its roots, with uh, ADD 5th edition being sort of a modernized, streamlined sort of nicer version of the original Dungeons and Dragons. I would say it sort of follows the, what they call the Back Me series of Dungeons and Dragons, but that's another video. Anyway, in this case, they said, look, you know what? Enough is enough. That's a, such a mess of changes and characters and whatsoever. And there was also level bloating with the uh, heroes of the place because as you have to keep these people in the story of the realms to tell the stories that change stuff all those heroes had to be powerful in the books and so you know level bloating was a real thing in forgotten realms especially in the, by the end of the second edition it was like level 40 stuff and i'm not joking okay i can even show that because for example in the this is one of these pearls of Dungeons and Dragons that few people know about. This, this book here, Faiths and Avatars, is probably the best book about deities there is in the whole of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's among the best. It's really, really good. Doesn't matter what campaign setting you are playing. If you base your gods or gods of, uh, of a war or whatever and take a look at the material here, you are in for an awesome time it's so detailed so well thought really an awesome book but it had this level bloating stuff so you can see here for example by the way great images of the, the priests of the many goddesses this is the goddess of pain for example actor is a priest of her and uh the the special priests they they got like to level they could get spells of such powerful levels where is this this here it is so here you see for example spell prog spell progression until level 40 and as you can see people used a lot of spells right a lot of spells like six from level seven six 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 it was not like so few contained spells like nowadays which is a good game design decision but at that time that was not the, the topic. At the time, playing and spellcaster was like, you suffer at the start, but then you get exponentially powerful. And at around name level, the people that play fighters are like, oh man, I had my fun on the mid levels, but now it's your game and I'm just a bodyguard. Not always, but it could end like that. Okay, so with that said, uh, let's, let's continue. With that said, we had this change, and then 5th edition made the big reset. Zack! It reset Forgotten Realms to practically back to its original state, really. It's practically, if you get this box here and use what is here, 
it's it's the Forgotten Realms as it is now. Maybe a few heroes changed names or changed even gender, which is also good because, as you know, the game got more equalized with the time. Like, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but everybody got. But like I said, that you are playing the original realms with the fifth edition stuff, and uh, that's the reason why we were moving here, because the Forgotten Realms had this in the original version. It uh, it has some characteristics that. Even though they reset it, the 5th edition doesn't really use it. Example. In the original Forgotten Realms, uh, the written word was very rare. Like you had lots of runes around, of course, from the many uh, creatures. But, but written stuff was rare. It was not come. Like it was also not come for people to know how to read at all. And even the common language, it was not common as a written language. The only language that was common was the, the, the elf, elfin language and to a certain extent the dwarven one. So human traders would trade in common and they would have some, like, some symbols and so that say quantities perhaps or some stuff or symbols that people recognize. Oh, this is food. Oh, this, these are uh, the no grain. But otherwise it was not like a, a real thing that you can read. Uh, it's interesting because by the time they did the second edition of the game and the books went out, the book sort of forgot that and there's way more paper going around the stories and people reading, but in the original one this was something that was considered rare in the, in the game. Uh, and this, this makes it special, right? So in, in our campaigns we start at the first edition version of the game. I'm still unsure if I will start in using the, f the fifth edition rules from the start and just adapting them to the feelings of the original realms or whether we are gonna do it a bit more fun and do like 0e and then move to first e and then move to second e by the time the last events happen that would be cool i may do that i'm still I'm still thinking anyway by by next thursday i have to have that in mind right because <laughs> this is when we will be rolling the characters so this is gonna be fun Cool, so that sort of sums up what the Forgotten Realms are about. The Forgotten Realms, so let me make it in three points. The Forgotten Realms is, are a very old campaign, very famous, that ties its in-game meta plot to the changes of the rules from the, the game itself. It's pretty cool. And it has, the, the different thing in it is that the gods represent like very specific aspects of reality. And they don't really care about their worshippers, especially in the first edition version of the game. They don't care at all. Because different than other this depiction of deities in Dungeons and Dragons, at the start at least of the story of the realms, the gods are not dependent on worshippers. They are not dependent upon what people think of them. They are really like deities in a very distant sense. Look, I am here and if you worship me, I may give you power. And if you don't, it's your, you're like, pff, you're bad. And that sort of changes through story too, but in a very cool way, painful for the gods, sort of, <laughs> and painful for the poor mortals that have to go through it. And uh, those mortals are, of course, our players, because as we say in Portuguese, in our, the motto in Portuguese for this channel is that this is RPGs are games of fantasy and magic where you are the punch bag. And, uh, that holds, that holds for, for Forgotten Realms 2, especially on the transition period, which is the one we're gonna play. Cool, with that said, I finish this uh, video now. Now you have this core explanation of the, the events of the realms and uh, looking forward for those who, who accompany us. Uh, although, like, uh, like I said, the, the one of the main games, it's in Portuguese, so if you you understand Portuguese, great. If not, you can laugh as you see our people uh, screaming and stuff and getting yeah, a hell of a time. Or perhaps a good time if they have luck during the events that unfold at the start of the year of 1358. Yes, 58. Uh, the Rams nowadays are it's sort of 150 years later. Like if you play Officially, 5th edition, you are playing on the realms during the year 1580 80 to 90, depending on what campaign you are doing. Uh, 
but at the time here this is 150 years before right so that's but like i said with the reset they're almost the same cool that's it for this part of this stream uh i'm gonna follow this up with with more stuff now more more information but i may change back to portuguese now i actually should do it in german guys because, because the the europeans are mostly swiss or german so Sollte ihr ihnen alles erklären. Also Leute, wir haben ein bisschen da über die vergessene Reiche. But I can do that not in, <laughs> not on the stream perhaps. Then send them later the primer. All right, that's it for for this. Let's change now the stream. Probably gonna do some speed running now, so this has nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons. For those who were with us until now, hey. Thanks for showing up. Click that like follow button. Or if you have a question, just put it on. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's it for the dangerous, dangerous part for, for now about the Forgotten Realms. One thing that I want to go later on is I want to do a primer about only the deities because I got the partner, the companion to that awesome book that I told you guys about. This is the Demi Human Deities book. Also an awesome one. I have this one, I have even in my plastic here because it's, it's way way more uh, best condition than the older one <laughs> but they are both by the same guys and that they're, they're worth it and that's a very similar quality and the original demi human date is from forgot that was not tied to the forgotten realms from the second edition it's also a very very good book very very good and uh, the material there hey precious stuff you can you can use a lot of it uh, to improve and make way more interesting Dungeons and Dragons games or any RPG that uses fantasy settings uh, because the ideas there are cool there are really a lot of cool ideas great so let's change the the view now bang the t oh no there's not this one what the realms and this is the yeah so so that's it ah, go with him. shy puff and go with him us here hi there <laughs> cool this finishes it for this session but you know what i am in on a roll now i may, may go for this god stuff right away yeah you know what gods of the realms all right video from today is about the gods of the forgotten realms and to show that i'm gonna use this wonderful book here show it to you guys which i was speaking about it on another video the damn bam, the deities and faiths and avatars and here we can here we have sort of a show of all the gods and like i said on my forgotten realms primer uh, session uh, or, or video man, which was just before this one the 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 realms have lots of of deities and these dates are responsible for very specific aspects of reality they see that chaos does not come back and get those aspects out of the way. So, for example, there's the date of cold, the date of, of strife, the date of pain. So if, if I have a pain, oh, I go to the clerics of pain and they may even give me more pain. If they think, oh, your pain is not enough actually for what you have to whatever learn in life. Or, oh, okay, we treat your pain. So they are the ones specialized in pain alone. And then you have the goddess of cold and then you have the god of, of you have for example the god of war but you also have the god of conflict only of strife this is something that greyhawk had also similarly but different the difference between greyhawk and the realms is like in greyhawk the the gods have this connection to the world this they, they have like the worshippers and them it's sort of a give and take like we, we depend on each other and in the realms originally that's not like that okay the, the gods don't give a to anything all right so and one thing the oh, this this is a pretty cool drawing here from the original book that showcases the elemental gods uh, actually not the gods of the elements in themselves these are the gods of the 
of when the elements go awry and you have one god for every aspect you have the god of the storms and you have the god of the thunder and you have the god of the world you know like you have one god for each aspect of terror and pain that may happen <laughs> in your yes we have ogma for the knowledge for example hi there you go welcome welcome there you go and so so the realms have very specific deities this is pretty pretty fascinating and what is more fascinating if you have the older editions is that is that they have every deity had sort of between yeah three to not more they had about they had about three to seven spells in the many different levels specific to this deity like it's not, ah, I'm a god of light, so I have the light spells. Okay, another guy with fireball. No, 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 you had, you had the fire of this guy that works like this deity once. And, and the spells were very, like, they had a lot of charm, you know? <laughs> These spells, they had a lot of uh, uh, character because they were so specific to the god. And then, then you know, I, I, am, I am a follower. Let me show them. I'm a follower of, for example, Talos. Uh, no, this this guy is cool. This guy is. Let me let me get oh, this guy is cool. This this is one a special one. So I'm a follower of Gaunt. Look at the many tools he has here. Gaunt was sort of the god of of uh, creating stuff, you know, of create of invention of of smiths, of those who want to use their intellect to, out of the chaos, create form. So, so the many spells of the gold priests are based on this idea, how can I make stuff, how can I create very specific stuff? Let's, let's take a, an example uh, here. For example, and, and in, in that in, in which you are a god of creating stuff, you are the god of, of learning how to use stuff. So one of his powers is that he can, uh, of his god, uh, priests, is that they can impair someone with the knowledge about how to use something. And for example, one, one, the, the classic example is that you get a mage and say, look, take this two-handed sword, go for it, boy. I'm a mage, I have never trained in that before. The knowledge is with you, because this is a tool tool of war but it's a tool and if it's a tool it falls into the realm of my god now go boo and then perhaps they would not fight like a specialist fight because that would be the god of war portfolio but it's a tool of war it's a tool for something in this case war and then the mage would be able to fight temporarily with the sword using the spell for example so it that's one cool thing and they can use this for many other kinds of uh, knowledge related to tools and and, and creating stuff and and that level of specialty, you can adapt these spells for 5th edition without, without much difficulty. And of course, you don't need to do for all of them. You just get a, a player that's using one of the priests and then, okay, let me see these spells here. Let's do this. Let's change them. And then you get it. So, this is cool. Let's see what, what else can we show. Uh, this aspect of the gods, it appears already here on the Adventures one. Yeah, because here they, they comment that uh, most priests are what they call uh, clerics, that those are sort of... Uh... Oh yeah, I forgot to tell about that on my Forgotten Realms Primer, damn it! <laughs> this is a major thing. Wild magic, as we know it in the current editions, was born in the Forgotten Realms. Because during this time when the gods go awry, like I said, magic also goes awry. And, and it goes awry because, like, it magic or in, in many aspects of magic are part of the portfolio from some deities and as these deities go nuts so do does magic and it's not the nice table where you have a flower you even have flowers in the table originally too but not like the the, the table from the fifth edition it's it's too too nice it's a too nice we are at magic table the one from the tomb of magic from the second edition it's like I find it like the okay one, the one that like is dangerous, but it's also very rewardful. It's insane, it's crazy go nuts, but it's like really crazy from good to bad, from very good to very bad. And the original table, it was 
like bad you know like usually magic sucked and this is an extremely correct simulation of the events as told in the novels about this period they tell like people who were afraid of magicians and clerics because all kinds of magical power were affected so even if I click, I'm not gonna heal you. Supposing your god is nearby, because otherwise you can't. But let's say you try. Hey, it can go completely crazy. It can really like I don't know a fireball lands on you, uh, or or you or you throw a fireball at someone and it goes back to you at maximum damage. So there was like many awful possibilities that could happen, and. Uh, from a game game design perspective, a modern modern game designer, it was like, okay, guys, so everybody that's gonna play this, they're they are all masochists, right? They want they want the lady of pain right near them, because this this is nuts. And uh, yeah, it's nuts, but they themselves mentioned the, the the creators in the books that like, look, you as a dungeon master, you have of course the freedom to see that this stuff is still playable, right? We want to have a good story being told. And the birth of a second edition was also the birth of RPGs as the storytelling format for epics, playable epics. That's when it, that was born. Because in the past, groups were not like nowadays, where they are usually actually like one big player divided in five characters that go through, advent, through one advent, right? Fuck. And they do stuff together all the time. Like in the past, it was not like this. And uh, this changed with second edition, sort of. Or was like, it was getting more and more like that the game, and in second edition was like official. Now we are playing epic heroes. And that's not a bad thing, but it's a style change that happened. Great. So, and with that said, Magic had an extremely big role in the realms, and therefore, there are lots of, the realms have, has a lot of books that deals only with very, very different magic types of magic or ways to use magic or, or magic spells and if you had the, the many campaign settings from the many Dungeons and Dragons books uh, you would see that the Forgotten Helms had by far the, the greatest quantity of different magics that you could add to the game especially if you believe if you go with the idea that the Tom of Magic was created because of the wild magic from the Forgotten Realms so, so like magic is a ve it's a high magic setting it's a setting where there's a lot of magic around for good or for bad a lot of people that use magic, people in the realms, like the common people, are not unused to it. Depending on the period, they are very afraid of it because of the, the madness, right? But otherwise, like, they are, it's not like, oh, a magic user, oh my god, oh, no, it's not like that. This is, this is a very different aspect of playing in the realms than in other fantasy settings. Uh, I... Sadly, I would say the 5th edition watered all that down a bit, but that's part of the rebirth of Dungeons and Dragons as a hobby, right? Uh, it had to make like a more simple, direct way to, to, to get into the hobby and play the game, so you can't com overcomplicate stuff. I um, completely understand that, but that's why there are channels like mine, right? So that I can show you guys wh what was things coming from. And all that is inspiring ideas for you to put in your own games. So do not make magic be just using like a lousy 3d6 for damage. Make it something different. Let players change and handle that as they see fit. Let them let they go nuts. It's it's pretty more. It's way more fun if you make magic magical. I give a very simple example. In the last game we had. Uh, it was just the sand Sunday. We had our cast, our Curse of Strahd, and one of the players was the Cleric of the Sun and used this the fifth edition. And it, he was this spell where you call sort of a guardian, and this, I, I forgot how it's came. I believe it's, spirit, it's not spirit guardians. Anyway, it's this one big guardian that when a, uh, an enemy comes close, the guardian strikes them and gives a lot of damage. It's a very powerful spell, third level. And he asked me, Look, I called this spirit to help me. Can't I? It's a third level spell. Can't I cast that so that the spirit raises those that gate that we get to have to go through? And then I was thinking, look, that goes that uh, first makes for an awesome moment in the story. Second, it's a third level slot that he's spending just to have a gate pulled up. So, rule of awesome. 
do it boy go for it go for it let's do this and then he did it and it was awesome and so like this is one little thing but if you if you give your players opportunity to be creative with magic or with their powers uh, you are making for a better game don't let the rules uh, detain you from having your people be creative find different solutions and get to a better result cool so now i think we rounded up a bit of the, the forgotten realms and uh, i saw i lost myself on the god stuff but that that's expected on our live <laughs> any more questions any more inputs from the crowd we don't have a crowd today <laughs> but that's not that's not a problem okay all right ah the igor is in youtube man you you come from youtube i can see the the, the icon there some some is in, are in, in twitch so we have the many different visitors there great so let me close this aspect of the video that is it for golden realms primer now now it's cool now it's a good now it's really a good, a good close up for it and uh, 